Hey, so I want to explore GraphQL on this channel and I will start by this video as a quick and fast introduction. I will go through the basics of GraphQL and then we will start practicing writing some small queries on an API that I built for this. At the end, we will, at some point in the series, we will build our own API, our GraphQL API and uh, like get, get, get our hands dirty basically. So I think one good way to understand the GraphQL is to compare it with the RESTful API, uh, like philosophy, I would say. If you don't know RESTful API, it's fine. You still, you will, I think you will still get some value out of this. So in RESTful API, you have multiple endpoints and each endpoint could respond to a resource or multiple resources. And if you want to combine the result from multiple endpoints, you have to call them individually, then do some things to combine, like write some code that combines all of this in a correct way or some APIs exposes single endpoints that aggregates things, but that's something to remember. You have multiple endpoints, you know, you need to know which API, which endpoint to call and then call it and combine the result, that's something. Uh, also in, in RESTful APIs, there is this thing called overfitching, which is I'm gonna request all of the users that exist in this API. And I'm only, I only care about their IDs, but this API will give me everything about the users, which is, it's, it's an overfitching. I, I don't need the name and the date of birth for every user. I only need the IDs. I mean, all of these problems, it's not, I won't call them problems, but all of these things, all of this, all of these behaviors from the RESTful APIs are, uh, are something to remember when you compare it to GraphQL APIs, because that's, that's, that these are basically one of the things that GraphQL wants to solve. Because they might they might be harmful in some situations, but it's not always. And also, all of these things that I mentioned, they could be fixed in the graph in the RESTful API context. Uh, you can make it more like dynamic. You can you can fix these things uh, in one way or another. You can use documentation tools to create some sort of a schema for people to know what kind of things they query or from which endpoint. So you can make things easier. These things are not as bad as like. Some people might make them sound to be. Uh, but so in GraphQL, you have a single endpoint and that's it. Or you always send every GraphQL query to that endpoint. And something I really like is the flexible queries you can write in GraphQL because for each GraphQL API, you need to define a schema. And the schema is everything that is queryable in that GraphQL API. And through that schema, because you define the relations between every type, so a schema is defined by a set of types because you define the relations between these types so when you do that the graphql engine can easily generate some kind of a documentation that tells everyone how to query this api and how to traverse these relations through a single query so it's, this is really something i this is something i really like because it allows a flexible way to query your api you can traverse the resources traverse the relations and um, get whatever you want it's really powerful i will show you in a moment Doing that in RESTful API is a bit harder, in my opinion, and it requires some crazy query param sending, and some does not cover a lot of cases that in GraphQL it's way easier to cover. So I I like GraphQL mainly for this person, mainly for this reason, at least for now, maybe I'll change my opinion in the future. But uh, this is another thing about the schema and the scheme and the type system, because you define it when you create your own API, you will end up with a really good documentation about what things the client should expect, which is really cool. Um, there are some solutions like this in the RESTful API, like the Swagger, and some frameworks comes with a native integration. So every time you create an endpoint, it will be documented and stuff. Uh, but still, I think the GraphQL approach is way more dynamic and much more um, descriptive, in my opinion, and much, much more genuine, I would say. Anyway. Now, another thing you need to know in the GraphQL, you, the response according the, to the specification should always be 200. That's a big difference from RESTful APIs. But I've seen APIs that uses GraphQL and retains different status code. But at least according to the specification, which I linked it here, it should be 200. And for the errors, you might retain an array of errors that describes what happened. But the response usually contains that, always contains the data object and might contain the errors array. That's the always, this is the response. So it's consistent, which is another thing I like about GraphQL API, it's consistent. Same status code, same shape of response. That's, a, that's good. Mainly people use POST requests when communicating with GraphQL APIs, but 
that's not our uh, but that's not according to the specifications it's up to you you can specify any kind of method now the basic blocks of graphql is three subscriptions mutations and queries subscriptions are a way to tell the server hey i want to subscribe to real-time events through web sockets or server side events that's outside of the scope of the current series maybe in the future Mutations, mutations are also outside of the scope, but this is a way to tell the server, hey, I want to modify this resource. Here's the new data to override it with. Uh, and the queries, this is the focus now. This is the client telling the GraphQL server, I want this response with this with this shape. Uh, this is the, the focus. And every GraphQL, and these three types, these three building blocks, which are also called types, these are the starting point for each GraphQL query. And the, I'm going to focus on type one, which is written like this. So type a query, and you define under it the fields that the user can query on the root GraphQL query. I know this sounds strange, but I will give you some examples in a moment. So you go on your GraphQL server, you define a query, and under it you define some types. And here in this example, I am defining a field called user that accepts an ID. So I can query users by IDs, by ID, and then this retains a type of a user. And this type of user, it's defined here, it contains ID, which is an integer, name, a string, and an array of posts. And each post contains these two fields, ID, integer, body, string. So just by defining this schema like this, a potential query could be, this one is called user with posts. So this is a way to name your query. And I'm, I'm requesting the user field, which I know it will retain a user. So I can add inside of it, open these two brackets, add ID name and posts. Posts also points to an array of another type, which is post. I can also go, go do this. So this is a valid query according to this uh, schema. And the schema is defined by a bunch of types. The starting point would be the query type or a mutation or service or subscription but something to remember this is the query this is the root for each query everything defined here will be the, the root level at even each query so i can't go deep query the posts directly because it's not added here i can only query the posts through going through a user and to query a user i use this i i query the field user on, under the type query that's something really important to remember. And if you represent all of these types as a graph and start connecting these uh, relation points or relation prospects between each one of them, you will end up as with a graph like this. This is the, the, this is the starting point of query. Query points to a user. I can query it through the user. I can query uh, a comment, an order, a review. Through th Then when I query a review, I can go back and query the comments for that review. And for each comment, I can query the orders that are associated with that comments and for each order i can go then query all of the users that are maybe ordered the same order or maybe participate in that order or these kind of things so it's a, a mesh of connected graphs sorry it's a, it's a mesh of connected nodes and for through each node you can query other kind of nodes so this is what i meant by flexible queries you can you allow your client to specify what they want and traverse the whole resources that are connected with each other and then you give them the response it's really cool and the thing that gets the data and puts them in the corresponding fields called resolvers so on this type of query we expose this field called user graphql will expect that we define a user resolver and this user resolver should retain a user object and then for each field the user requested it, it will be extracted from the retained value from that resolver and then attached to the corresponding field and if there is a field that corresponds with a, a resolver with the same name it, that resolver will be called and the result will be attached in that corresponding field so that's basically the idea and there are so many things here to discuss and talk about but just remember that each resolver can invoke another resolvers and these resolvers can invoke another resolvers and so on. And this is called the resolver chains. And each resolver gets the result from the previous resolver. So in our example, this will amount to two resolvers. 
we have the user resolver and we have the post resolver this is maybe too much for the first video but these are things that you need to keep in mind when you walk, when talking about graphql now let's write the small queries which i will show you everything and i will show you how dynamic this is we will have a i will show you now the types so these are our types we have a type query i will say this is number i will go one second ignore this basically i have this type i'm gonna copy it put it here and I'm gonna tell VS Code this is a GraphQL. So we have 42 lines of types, and this is really simple. So I have a type company contains three strings, geo, two strings, latitude and longitude. Address contains these four strings and also points to a property to a field from this type. I have a user which com contains all of these things. Most of these things that I like integer and the strings, these are called the scalar types, these are primitive types. Company po points, the company field points to a company uh, type, which is, contains these three things. Address points to this. A next user, it's pointing to the user type itself, so you have you can have these cycle, cyclic references to types, which is something also interesting. And the posts field points to an array of posts, which is, that's the post, it contains four fields uh, that are scattered and also a user field that points to the user type itself. And this is the query, this is the root query we can write. We exposed three fields. Hello, which retains an array of strings, a number that retains uh, an integer, and a user that accepts an ID that retains a user. Okay, this might sound like gibberish. Let's just go practice querying that. So every GraphQL server comes with this UI tool that allows you to query these things or query the fields that is, are exposed to just view them because you define the schema, GraphQL knows how to build a documentation for it because everything is defined. I can click here, I see this is the root types, I can click on this query. This is the, these are the things I can query for. So I'm going to start by writing a query, my query. I'm going to say number because these are the fields I can query. And I know this is an integer, so it's a scalar type. I don't need to do anything. I just say number. So I hit enter. I get my response. It's 200, and I get the data inside of it as this number. I can also say hello, which is defined here. This will retain an array of strings. I get that array of strings. Now I have this user field. So if I type it, I will get an error this saying, hey, this Field user of type user must have a selection of subfields. Do you mean opening a bracket, which you should do with every object type? So this is correct, but now it will complain that I'm not selecting anything. So let's go select the ID, but now it will also complain because it needs to accept an ID. So, so this is the type of flexibility. This is the type of flexibility and the type of somehow, like I know what I'm doing. I know what kind of things I'm expecting. I know what I can query. This is way nicer than RESTful APIs, in my opinion. This is really cool. So I can just now hit Control Enter or press this, and I get that. I can also query anything. If I if you want to know the things you, you can query from here, you just can you can do like press Enter, then Command Space, you get a list of all of the things, or you can click on the user type, and you get all of the things you can query. So let's go and query the address, or let's get the name. Let's get the address and i know that i need to open a curly brackets because the address is another type and i can get the streets i can get geo which is also another type this is really good and also another thing you can have aliases so i can call this uh, my field and the query it and also query it again so this is really nice like i just i hope you see and this works even here, uh, random. I changed this to random, so it's really cool. Now, another thing, I have also this post field. Let's go query it. Posts, because it's an array of objects, I need to also uh, open this. And when I say array of objects, this also means array of types. So types could also point, this is an object type. 
which is not a primitive, not a scalar. And inside of this, I can have the user ID, I have the ID, I have the title of the post. So now I get all of the I, all of the posts for that user of ID one. Now here is the thing about traversing all of your resources. If you go to the post type, you can see it points to a user. So guess what you can do? I think you maybe you know now. I can reference the user or resolve the user from here and go select ID and name. Maybe it does not make sense in this example because I'm re resolving the same user, but just imagine this is a different type. So I went to resolve the user. Now for each user, I'm going to go resolve the posts. Which also works. I get the, this is the post. This is the user. And for each user, I'm resolving the posts again. So it's really dynamic and it's really, it's a cool way to traverse all of your schema, all of your resources in one query. So it's really cool. And look, like if you remember the definitions we wrote, they were really small, like 40 lines, and we were able to do all of these things. And now something really cool, I will go comment this out. I, there is a, pro if you go back to the user field, to the user type, we have this next user thing. I'm gonna call it. And I will select ID and name. If I run it, this will give me the next user of ID2. If because this also retains a user, which is the same type, I can also call next user here. And I can call it again. And I think you know what does what this what does this do? It gets the current ID from the parent object that we got we already resolved. It gets that ID, increase it by one, then resolve that user. So I get two, the next user will be three, next user will be four, and I can keep doing this indefinitely until maybe I run out of users. Uh, but this is what this is like a, an example of the resolver chain. Every resolver can invoke another resolver, and the result from the current resolver that invoked the next one will be passed to it. That's why I can't this resolve the resolver that used this, the resolver that resolved this user has access to this object that's why it knows that id is one it added one to it then resolve that object and i can also here because this is a user type i can go also query the post so it's really cool um i don't know i hope this was a really good introduction because i think graphical is really cool and i used to be a hater i won't lie but now i really like it and that's it bye